let's just say a quick prayer here before uh, we start. And again, if you didn't hear me, because I wasn't sure if I was still muted um, when I was talking last time, um, just save your questions till the end and I'll do my best to answer everything um, that you have. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to uh, learn as much as we can about how to spread your truth around the world. We just ask, Lord, that you will be here in this meeting, that you will guide the words that I have to say to uh, help everybody and encourage everybody that um, anyone can reach the world. You don't have to be anybody special with the power of God, the, the free power that you offer to us, Lord. We can move mountains. And uh, I pray and I thank you for um, in advance. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right. I do have a presentation PowerPoint, but let's see here. Um, Randall, I guess you're supposed to start the recording. I'll jump into speaker view here. All right. Now, one of the things that I like to do before I give any presentation is tell people uh, where I came from, uh, how I got to where I am today. So I want to just tell you a little story and stories can be so powerful. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this. You're going to find a little bit later, we're going to talk about story uh, just briefly, but um, you can you can affect people in such a great way by stories. You can build groups of people uh, and change their lives by just stories alone, okay? But we're gonna talk about what other things you can do in, in addition to stories to produce social media content, not only that looks good, but connects with people. So let me share my screen. All right, that looks like it worked. Now for me, yeah, everything really began when I was about three years old. I remember uh, my mother used to take me to the airport when I was very young. There was a little uh, tower there uh, on next, or there was a little area next to the tower where you could look at the airplanes land. And I was, I was amazed as a young child with airplanes, just watching them land. Uh, everything actually that had anything to do with flight, I was amazed at. And that never really went away. Um, it just really grew as I went on in life. So at, a, at an early age, I was attracted to aviation. I would um, I later learned how to fly remote control airplanes. In high school, I met a woman, her name was Darlene Kellner. This is actually a picture of her. And she was my science teacher. And Darlene, as you can see in this picture, is a skydiver. Actually, she's the fourth most experienced skydiver in the world. She has over 18,000 jumps. And we got to be friends when I was there in her class. And she invited me to come um, to, to the airport and watch the skydivers. And later, they offered me a job to work there. So that was actually my, real, my first real job. Uh, and I would work... Um, with Darlene, and let me just check a message here real quick. I just want to make sure. Okay. Um, I would work there at the airport and I would do video editing for uh, the customers that came in. So people would come in and they would want to, let me jump forward just for a second. Uh, most of the people, they would want to do tandem skydiving. And so they would pay to get attached to another person, jump out of the airplane. And Darlene would be one of the people that would video um, these customers. And then I would edit the videos for them really quick. And uh, that would be a part of you know, their, their package as uh, a business. Um, let me just, give me one second here. There we go. Um, so anyways, Darlene uh, is a friend of mine and, and has been for a long time, ever since I was 15 years old, learning um, video editing. And that was kind of the first introduction that I had to any real uh, media and uh, photography and video. Uh, now, Darlene, she's a pretty interesting person. Her and her husband actually got married while they were skydiving. Uh, her husband actually holds the Guinness World Record for the most jumps in the world. This is Don. Uh, he has over 45,000 jumps and uh, was on the cover of one of the Guinness World Record 
um, books. Now, when I was 18, I began skydiving there. Um, but not long after that, I think it was about a year, uh, I experienced something kind of traumatic, which is I observed one of the skydivers uh, hit the ground and he actually died. Um, you know, up until that point, skydiving was something that was really fun and exciting. And uh, I had no fears about doing it. I, I started and, and jumped for um, six months to a year uh, before this incident happened. And, you know, when you witness something like that, it really does affect you. It changes you. And uh, it was, you know, I, I had a hard time after that continuing to skydive, uh, seeing that happen. Um, and I think a lot of the time in people's life, they have some experience like that where they've experienced something uh, and it changes them. And we have to remember that every, every bit of video content that we create is going to be seen by each person in a little bit different light based on the experiences that they've had. Now, we're going to talk about audience uh, and how to reach the audience in just a second here. But um, at this moment, I want you to just remember that when you create video content, if you think something's a good idea, that's fine. But you have to get to know the audience that you're trying to reach. If you don't understand the people that are on the other end of that phone or computer or television, you're going to have less success. It's going to be more difficult for you to reach people. You have to understand who these people are, what their fears, their desires, and hopes are. Um, so continuing on uh, with my story here. Um, after that, I was influenced so much by Darlene that I... Um, I got my pilot's license. So I started flying, and this is one of the small airplanes I used to fly. Here's another one. Uh, this is a helicopter I learned how to fly. Uh, and this is actually what I fly right now. This is called a powered paraglider. And so aviation has always been a really big part of my life. Um, it was the introduction to video production for me. Um, this is where I work right now. It's called the Potomac Tracon. I do the approach control for the Washington, D.C. area. And... Um, this is what it looks like. I just sit in a big dark room and look at a radar screen. My job is to talk to the pilots and make sure that they don't hit. Now, when I was working here in Virginia, which is the reason that I came um, to this area, I started going to a church in Warrenton, um, which is in the same city as, as the um, facility that I work at. And a couple of years later, Pastor Mark Finley showed up and uh, started preaching. Now, uh, Pastor Mark, if you haven't heard him before, is a very inspiring person. And I was inspired as a lay person to do something with the sermons that Pastor Mark was preaching. Now, we, it was a pretty small church. We had old equipment. And I was the head deacon at the time. So I felt some responsibility, not to the, just to the church, but to help spread the truth um, and, the, and the sermons that Pastor Mark was speaking. So... This is the audio mixer that we that we had, right? Now we don't we're not in this church anymore, but uh, it was pretty old. I had to figure out a way to get the audio out of this thing and into this digital recorder so I could take it and upload it to the internet. And that was really the beginning of my digital ministry. So what I want you to understand is that I have I have no formal media training at all. Everything that I know has been self-learned, self-taught, or, or I all watch videos on the internet. I read manuals, uh, and I've read some books, trial and error, testing. Um, but I've never gone to school for anything like this. And even still, even without any of the, I guess you could say, professional training, we've been able to build a ministry that reached millions of people. So if I can do it with somebody without any you know, formal training, you can do it too. All right, we're going to talk about some of the important factors in, in getting, you know, something that works. But a few years after Pastor Mark came to the Warrenton, uh, Warrenton Church, we started this project, uh, which eventually turned into this church right here, which is the Living Hope Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is where Hope Lives 365 is based out of. And uh, this is kind of the beginning of, you know, the, the ministry that we've created uh, that is reaching around the world. Now, we were blessed with some equipment that came with the building, but again, uh, nobody knew know how to use the equipment. Um, nobody taught us. We just 
went and learned as, you know, we just learned everything as we went. And again, I, I want you to understand that if I can build a, a media ministry that can reach 13 million people in the last two years, um, that can reach every single country on YouTube, except for the ones that it's banned. If I can do it, then you can do it too. Okay. Don't ever forget that. Don't think that you need to go to some special school or that it's going to take years and years to, to learn how to do this. I'm going to give you like the main factors, the main things that you need to do to reach people. And if you do them, if you, if you do them and then you perfect them, you can reach millions of people too. Now, maybe you've seen some of our content. Uh, this is a, uh, let's see here. There we go. This is a picture of our YouTube channel. Uh, and you can see some of the videos we have there at the top um, that are reaching, you know, a few hundred thousand people, some of them uh, almost a million people. Now, one of the things I want you to understand is that when you think of online ministry, on creating video content for the internet, not all social media platforms are created equal. Um, some people create YouTube, uh, they create YouTube, uh, or, excuse me, they, um, they, they want to do the same thing with Facebook and YouTube, and you can't really treat them the same. Uh, of course, we have Instagram and there are others, but you have to remember that each one of the social media platforms has their own culture. They have a way that people use them. Now, when people go on Facebook, they're typically scrolling through many things, all right? They're going to go on there, and I'm sure many of you do this, so you know uh, if you don't do it, this is, this is how people use these platforms. When people go on Facebook, they are generally looking at things and many, many things, right? They're not generally spending hours or even many minutes watching videos. Now, Facebook does have video, um, but if you really want to reach people with video content, uh, YouTube is really where it's at, okay? So if you're creating video, you want to use YouTube as the video platform to reach the people and use Facebook to promote your videos. So what I normally do is I'll take a link to the YouTube video and put it on Facebook and say something about it and to uh, and promote that video on Facebook. So uh, I just want to get you started on the right foot here, right? If we're going to create video content, put it on YouTube, right? If you want to use Facebook, you use Facebook as a way to communicate with people, to talk to a community, and to promote your video content on YouTube. Now, you can, you can put videos on, you, on Facebook. I'm not saying don't do it. Um, it's more apt to have shorter videos. But really, if you want to reach people with video, use the number one platform in the world for any video content. I don't care what it is. If you're talking about television, satellite, wherever videos watch, YouTube has more, um, they have more people there than any other place in the entire world. So don't, don't neglect YouTube. So the, the question, the next question is, um, where, where do we actually start? Uh, where do you start? Um, sometimes people get confused on all the different platforms. They get Instagram and, and they have their own video platform. Now we've got TikTok and everything else. I'm going to make it pretty simple for you. If you want to create videos, put them on YouTube, promote them on Facebook. But when you come up with uh, or when you want to create a video, really everything starts with an idea. Okay. Now, a lot of people like to do this. They come up with this great idea that they think is great. And then they, they make this video and then nobody watches it. This goes back to what I was saying before, which is you have to understand the people that you're speaking to. You have to understand the audience that you're trying to reach. Just because you think something is a good idea doesn't mean that other people are going to like it. Maybe other people are going to think it's boring. So the point I want to get across to you is that you're going to have a lot more success if you do planning of whatever idea it is that you create before you actually make the video. A lot of people, they just come up with the idea and they go, they go record the video and then they upload it. And then maybe people watch it. Maybe, maybe people don't. Um, take the time to think out what you're going to do, what you're going to say, and, and how this is going to come across to a, a specific audience before 
you actually go and make the video. I always tell people, because I teach people about YouTube too. I always tell people, come up with a title and then create the video. Because when you come up with a title, now you're not bound by the video content that you always create that you already created. You come up with this amazing title and then you meet the expectation of that title, uh, whatever it is, and you're going to be even more successful um, because really the uh, when people are on YouTube, for example, um, the titles and the thumbnails are really all they see before they get to go to your content. That's what people are deciding uh, or that's the, the that's the metadata that people see before they decide whether they want to watch your video. So you don't want to take the titles and the thumbnails lightly because those things uh, are going to get them to click. Now, when you come up with that, this idea, whatever it is, you have to decide, are you going to teach something? Or maybe you're going to entertain people? Uh, or maybe you'll inform them. Those are really the only three options that you have. Uh, anything that you have is going to really fit in those three categories. And the problem, the reason I say that, the reason I bring these three up is because what I see a lot of people doing, a lot of people using YouTube for is what they should be using Facebook for, which is they're using it as a, like a way to advertise and promote the, the thing that they do. And they wonder why they create video after video after video and they don't reach anybody. And that's because, because YouTube is a value platform. YouTube designed it. This is an audience to, a peop to people that want to watch it. And now, there's a lot of things important and people need to do that but youtube is designed to reach a person with content that has value what you don't want to do is you do not want to create commercials if you want to put if you want to create a commercial then you create a commercial and you and you use it as, as an advertisement on youtube you know you pay for an advertisement and you put it somewhere or maybe you make an advertisement you put it on facebook but don't create a commercial type video where you're just telling people about all the great things that you're doing and then upload it to YouTube and wonder why, you know, you get 10 people or maybe 100 people that watch this video. So uh, teach, entertain, inform people, but do not create commercial type content and put it on for advertising and another video. All right. So here's the biggest problem that we face when we create um, social media content, especially for YouTube. And I'm going to kind of keep going back to YouTube because like I said before, YouTube is the place where you want to put your videos. The biggest problem that we face is that the, the attention span of most people is very low. We're so distracted and there's so many things that we can uh, give our attention to that keeping the attention of a person listening or watching can be, can be very difficult. Uh, I, I was reading an article a few years ago and they, they were saying that humans now have the attention span of less than a goldfish, which is kind of amazing. I think a goldfish, I think I wrote it down here. Uh, a goldfish, I think, is nine seconds. Uh, humans uh, in, I think this was 2013 that they took the, um, they did this test, are now eight seconds. That's down from 2020 when it was like 12 or 13 seconds. So if you only have eight seconds of attention span, that means that when you first, when you create this content in the first eight to 10 seconds, you really have to do something interesting out of the ordinary with expectation to keep the attention of the viewers. And we'll talk a little bit about how to do that uh, in a second here. But the point is, is that you don't want to open up with your video content and have like a 20 second trailer at the beginning or intro which a lot of people do. You don't want to open up and, and you know, say your name and who you are and uh, without intention. You know what I'm saying? Like in, on YouTube, right? Sometimes you can get away with that on television or in other places. But on YouTube, people can click on a million other videos and they're just sitting there everywhere. So you have to be really careful at grabbing the attention of a person right away. Okay, so let me give you some different categories 
right? Now we're going to go through the process of creating the content. I'll take you through the different process that I go through and each item that I'm thinking about to create a, 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 a nice piece of content, a good, a good piece of content that people want to watch and that people uh, think is interesting. Now, the first thing I'm going to talk about is location. You have to understand. Oh, I'm sorry. Give me one second here. All right, here we go. So uh, location. Um, now think about the idea that you might have. Maybe you want to create uh, a Bible study. And you could do that anywhere, but it would make a lot more sense if you were in, say, a church, for example. You have to understand that when people are seeing things, there is some some subliminal things that are going on in their mind that that help them decide whether or not they actually like something. And when you do things that make sense to the brain, right? That's going to help keep the attention of the person. If you make the brain work too difficult, it's going to neglect the content, right? An example of that would be um, if you go to YouTube and you look at the thumbnails, if you find a thumbnail that's very cluttered, right? And it makes the person think too hard. Uh, those are thumbnails are typically people don't click on. Most of the time you, when you find a video that does really well, the thumbnail is very simple. It's, um, it has a lot of intent to it to make the person think about something. So make sure that, sorry guys, I'm just going back here. My uh, speaker view is not matching up with, there we go. Uh, make sure that the location that you choose is functional. Make sure that the size meets the requirement, make sure it's quiet for the recording. Uh, and the feeling should be right. I was talking about if you're doing a Bible study, maybe you could do it inside of a church. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing a Bible study inside your home, whatever, that's fine. But if you do it in a church, it's better. It looks, it look, it, it feels better to the viewer. So those are the kinds of little tweaks that you can make along the way to help your content do better. Think about it this way. It's kind of like, you know, um, pushing a car, right? It's very difficult for one person to push a car. But if you get 10 people, you can push a car, no problem. So each one of these things is like a person and you want to, to, to create, you don't want to neglect, you know, all the little things just because they're little, right? Take intent in every single step that you do. And you're going to, you're going to end up with something much better than it would have been because you, you paid attention to the small details. All right. So uh, again, when we talk about location, we, we want something that is, um, non-cluttered, right? Yeah. Imagine the background of a location. You don't want a bunch of clutter and garbage in the background. Uh, same thing as the foreground. A lot of the time I see people do stuff like they put something um, bright or colorful in front of the speaker. It's really a bad idea, all right? The, the mind is very simple when, it talks of, when, it, when you talk about um, keeping the attention. Um, here, the mind is drawn to things that are moving, things that are colorful, things that are big. And so when you have a location, you want the subject to be the most prominent thing, the most colorful, the most well lit, uh, and the thing that's moving. You don't want to put a giant thing of flowers, for example, in, in front of the speaker. All right. You put those things behind. Th those are the times of the kinds of little details you want to pay attention to that are going to help create a better production. So that's location. Again, a pretty simplified version, but I want to give you just a, a broad overview. And if you have specific questions, we can answer those at the end. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is audio. Now, if you have bad video, you can get away with it sometimes. Uh, people will watch content sometimes where the video quality is not very good. Actually, there is a um, one of the largest channels on YouTube. He's got um, tens of thousands, I'm sorry, tens of millions of subscribers. I won't mention the name, but um, this person that creates video content, the video that they create is, is really kind of terrible, but they have been able to build an audience of millions and millions of people because of the great content that they create. Um, but the important point that I want you to understand is that audio is it's kind of more important than the video. Like I said, you can get away with having 
poor video, although I don't recommend it. I want to, we'll talk about that in just a second here, but audio, you cannot neglect the audio. Here's a picture of um, an audio meter. I took this out of Premiere and I just want to talk about one point in this picture. Um, if you have anything to do with audio, I drew a little, uh, a little red arc here from zero to 18 on the scale. This is what you're shooting for, all right? So if you create audio content, if you're the one at the mixing board, if you're editing the content in Premiere or some other editing platform, make sure that you get the audio level to at least minus 18 um, and closer to zero if you can. Uh, now, the reason for that is because there's like there's a standardized audio volume to most professional productions. And if your audio quality is low, for example, two things are going to happen. Number one, people are going to think that the video is low quality. And number two, if somebody's listening on a phone, for example, they may not be able to get the audio loud enough to actually listen to the content. Um, this is a this is a little bit more critical for live streams, for example, if you do a live stream, because in, in post you can edit the audio and you can boost it. So um, if you keep it, you know, somewhere between, you know, minus 24 or up, you can raise it up. But if you're doing something on the fly, like a live stream, for example, you want to make sure that you keep that audio at least at say like a minus 18 value. Um, even minus 12 would be a little bit better. You have to give yourself a little bit of room so that you're not clipping. Uh, you don't want to reach zero and then it sounds awful. But make sure that when you have audio, the audio quality is good. You can do that by making sure that microphones are close to someone uh, as opposed to trying to get the audio from a camera, for example. You don't want to do that. You can get away with um, the audio from a, camel, uh, a, a camera, um, like a phone, for example, if it's like really close to your face. But Anyways, major point here is don't neglect the audio. It's super important in making sure that the attention of a person is maintained. All right. If they can't understand, if it's not clear, if it's too low, they're not going to stick around. All right. So we talked about location. Um, that's audio. And again, I, you know, it's difficult to, to talk about some of these things in the time that we have. I want to cover a lot of things. So I'll leave just questions for the things you have. Uh, audio, you know, that we could, people take college courses for, for hours and hours and hours on, on audio. So if you have a specific question, I'll be glad to answer it. But um, let's move on to the next subject. That's lighting. Now, lighting is another really important item. Uh, it's something you definitely do not want to neglect. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is the different types of lighting. Now, when you talk about video quality, the lighting is really one of the primary factors of video quality. Now you, you definitely have the camera, the camera's ability to have low noise and to have dynamic range and nice color, but the, lighting, um, but the lighting is the reason uh, or one of the main reasons why the video content is good. All right. We talked a little bit before about making sure that the, the prominence of the subject is uh, the most well lit. You don't want to make sure you want to make sure that other things aren't the brightest uh, on the picture. Otherwise, that can distract the attention of the viewer away. Now, when you look at these pictures, say, for example, the top row uh, and some of the second row down, that's really what you're shooting for. We'll talk about specific lightings here in just a second, but you, you may or may not have lighting um, that you're using, like actual lighting. Maybe you're just sitting in a room with a lamp, but whatever it is, whether you have a window or a lamp, you can consciously think about where those lights are to increase you know, the, the, the picture that you have. Um, now, obviously it's ideal to have an actual light and you can place it on a stand in an exact location, but you can't always do that. Sometimes it's just a window. Sometimes you're, maybe you're sitting in your car or maybe you, you're, you have to use just a lamp in a room. Uh, and I'm gonna give you some principles to think about so that you don't have your video look like the bottom there, okay? All right. Here is now. Okay. So here's an example. This is called Rembrandt lighting. This is a, a good example. And I want to talk about a key, uh, a few key elements of why this is considered good lighting. Now, when you are lighting a face, 
right? And, and when you are doing video with a person in it that's speaking, that's really what you want to think about. You want to think about how is the face of the subject lit? Now you can think about lighting other things separately, right? If you want to light the background, that's fine, right? But whatever lights are lighting the face, you want to expose for and think about that. Okay, if you want to light the background, you do that separately. If you want to light other objects on, you know, the um, uh, the location, you can do that. That's fine. Those are separate. But when we talk about the face, all right, and hopefully, hopefully you can see my mouse here. I want you to think about a couple of things. The first thing is you want to see this little diamond of light here. That is the ideal shape uh, that you're shooting for. Okay, so think about this area right here under the eyes and the forehead. Those are your key spots when you're trying to figure out if somebody is exposed correctly. Now, this is a very specific type of lighting that has a dark shadow on the side. So let me bring up another example here. Okay, so here's four examples of lighting. In the upper left-hand corner, we have something called split lighting. Split lighting is where half the face is lit and half the face is dark. Uh, next to that is another example of Rembrandt lighting where you have that little triangle here. And um, from a technical standpoint, that triangle is created by the nose and the other side of the cheek, right? The, the lighting is placed at the side, but up high enough so it reaches over this corner of the nose and, and creates that little triangle. Uh, down in the lower left-hand corner is uh, a, a modified version of Rembrandt lighting where there's just more light and you see a shadow from the nose. It's called loop lighting. Now, ideally, you don't want the nose to go sideways like that. You want it kind of pointed down a little bit, so which means you need to raise the lights up. And uh, again, so you, you create a little shadow from the nose. You just don't want it going directly sideways. You want it to point down a little bit without touching the lip. And the last one is called butterfly lighting, which is a little bit different, uh, different to, um, it's a little hard to notice, I mean, um, but right under the nose is a little shadow. That's why it's called butterfly lighting. I think I have another example, but uh, if you were to be very close, you would notice that the shape of the shadow just under the nose, uh, it looks like a butterfly and that's why it's called butterfly lighting. This is a result of the light being directly in front, but above. And I'll show you where to put the lights here in just a second. Let's look at another example. Okay, so we have flat lighting, which is kind of like better than nothing, but something you generally want to avoid. You don't really want flat lighting unless you can help it. Flat lighting is better than no lighting, but you generally want to avoid flat lighting, right? On the second example here, we have butterfly lighting, which is uh, generally considered a very flattering light. Um, butterfly lighting is good for stages because people are moving around and they're looking in different directions. Uh, the lighting that I set up for Hopeless 365 um, in, in the church is butterfly lighting. All the lights are from the center, pointed straight ahead, and it creates um, two different things. Number one, it creates the butterfly lighting when they're looking forward, but if they turn their head sideways, it creates more of a Rembrandt loop lighting, which is why it's better for uh, stages, um, because no matter which way they look, they have some type of correct lighting, right? We move to loop lighting. This is a better example of loop lighting where you have the, the shadow of the, of the nose um, going a little bit down here towards the lip as opposed to directly sideways. This is ideal. The last picture wasn't really that good of an example. Uh, when you create this loop lighting, with it, which is a nice triangle of light on the uh, cheek there, uh, as opposed to this tight triangle, which is Rembrandt, you just wanna make sure that shadow is at an angle. Uh, and then we do have Rembrandt lighting, which is a little bit more of a uh, contrast. And last, we have split lighting. So. When you're, when you're trying to decide uh, or when you're trying to light yourself for whatever video you're creating, whatever content, shoot for one of these four over here, all right? There are a lot of different examples and there's other types of things you can do to lighting. You know, you can have a hair light, you can have a backlight, you can have side lights, fill lights, all these different things. Um, but we're talking about the face and you wanna just do one of these four. Butterfly, loop, Rembrandt, split. Shoot for one of those and the subject will be look much more pleasing. Your video content will look like it has much more value. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the position of your lights. Ideally, you wanna have three lights, but you can't always have three lights, all right? 
Now, there are generally three lights. This is called like a simplified, this is, this is like a basic setup. Uh, and you have a key light, a fill light, and a backlight. Now, the key light, that's your main light. And that's the light that creates, let me go back here. That's the light that's really going to create one of these shapes. So you get your key light and you place it at an angle. Normally it's at 45 degrees. Uh, that would be, you know, if you're creating something like this loop lighting, if you're doing a butterfly lighting, it has to go basically directly over top of the camera. Um, you know, or if it's on a stage, obviously it's in the middle of the room. And then the other side of the face, how dark that shadow is, like for example, over here, um, obviously this shadow is darker um, and you can control how dark this is. Imagine, imagine you're in a pitch black room, okay? And you create split lighting. Well, if, if it truly is a dark room and it has no reflective surfaces, half the, half the face is gonna be completely bright, uh, bright and the other half is gonna be completely dark. Okay. Now in most rooms you have natural fill that, you know, cause light is reflecting in different places. Um, but in a perfect environment or not, I don't want to say a perfect environment, but um, generally what you want to do is you want to use another light to fill in the shadows. And it doesn't actually have to be a light. You can use something that's reflective. They make reflectors that you can get and you can use those as fill lights uh, by reflecting the light back into uh, the other side of the face. And, you know, if you have the ability, you can have a backlight, which um, in these examples, you don't really have a backlight, but uh, having a backlight allows you to separate the subject from the background. And it gives you a little bit nicer touch. You can also have a little bit of a, um, a lighting on the back of the shoulders. It's kind of like just one extra thing you can do to make the image look nicer. So in a perfect or, you know, in a, uh, a ideal scenario, you have a key light, a fill light and a backlight that gives you um, everything that you would want. All you really need is a key light. And again, you can do that with a light. You can do that with a window or a lamp. Um, now, the position of the lights. The position is going to be based off of what um, what shape you want to create on the person's face. And generally shoot for loop lighting. That's like uh, loop lighting or butterfly lighting are probably your two most standard lights uh, or lighting um, uh, shapes on the face. And you want to have the light just off to about 45 degrees for, for loop lighting and directly over the camera for the butterfly lighting. And you want to have them up because this, this is obviously a top down view. You want to have it up about 30 to 60 degrees based on, again, what shape you want to create on the face. If you look at the Rembrandt lighting, the lighting has to be a little steeper. Uh, on the loop lighting, it's a little lower. The butterfly lighting is depending on, you know, how big of the butterfly you want. Um, what you don't want to do is you don't want the shadow from the nose to touch the lips. Okay. So when you create that butterfly lighting, put it wherever you want. Obviously, the higher you raise it, the more that shadow is going to get. Also, you're going to start to see a shadow uh, under the eyes, which is not ideal. So uh, shoot for something similar to this where it's not quite flat. There is a shadow under the nose. It helps create that dimension and shape, right? You can see the difference between these two where there's some shadow um, shadows on the side of the face that helps create dimension. That dimension is something that's typical for people to see in everyday life. And it helped cr create a more realistic and pleasant video for the people that are watching. All right, cameras. You know, a lot of time people come up to me and they'll say, hey, what camera should I, should I get? Actually, this just happened to me today. And it's very difficult for me to say, hey, go get this camera. Because there's like 100 different questions I have to ask to really recommend a camera. Because there are so many. And really, the reason there are so many is because... Um, Different cameras are better for different things. Are you going to be recording yourself? Is it in uh, a small room? Is it in a big room? And are you going to live stream with it? So, the, you know, uh, is there a person that needs to operate the camera? Is it going to be a robotic camera? Does it just need to stand there? I want you to take away a couple of things because there's a million and one articles you can read on, you know, what camera is right from you. So I'll, I'll answer your questions if you have any, but I'm not going to go into detail as to what camera you should be using. But I am going to tell you the most important factor when it comes to the video camera slash lens, and that is the depth of field. 
Now, if you don't know what depth of field is, depth of field is the amount of the image that's in focus. If you let this, if you look at this image example that I have in the upper left-hand corner, you can see that there's leaves and they're in focus. The depth of field is very small. And then if you move to the right, it's a little bit deeper. You can see the background to start. It's starting to become more in focus here. It's even more in focus in the lower left-hand corner and the lower right. Now you see the trees even more. Now, if you look at any professional video, I don't care who it is, any professional video, they always have shallow depth of field. It's actually, if you pay attention to how your eyes work, your eyes actually have very shallow depth of field. If you look at something that's very close to your eyes and you try to pay attention to the background, you're going to notice that the background is very blurry. And it's good for a couple of reasons. The, the mind generally perceives small depth of field as pleasant. And it also makes the subject very, um, very present. It, it, it takes away the distraction. If you look in the lower right-hand corner of this image, it's a lot more distracting of an image as opposed to the upper left-hand corner. It's, it's very strange. I, I don't know. I don't want to call it strange, but it's kind of strange how the brain works. When you look in the lower right-hand corner, it's kind of like unpleasant to the mind. And you look to the upper left, it's kind of like, ah. And you look at that image and it causes this reaction in your brain, almost a chemical reaction. Let's look at a, another example here. Whoops. There we go. Okay, so here's just another example of depth of field where you have shallow depth and um, a large depth over on the left image or, or the left yeah, copy of the image. And the reason that this happens, again, this is a little bit more of a basic thing, but the reason this happens is because of, of two things. Um, it, it's, it's a it's a product of the aperture size or the iris size of the camera or video that you're using. It's a product, I guess, three things. Okay, I take that back. It's a product of three things. The aperture or iris size of the camera or video that you're creating, the distance of the object and the background and the object to the camera or video, and the zoom length. Okay, so let me just unwrap that a little bit in case I lost you there. If you think about this image we're looking at, the person or uh, the person with the video or the camera here is very close to the flower. Whenever you have the video camera or a camera that's at a, a distance to the subject and then the background is very far away, it's going to help create a blurry background. Okay. It's going to help that. So if you want to create a blurry background, one of the things you can do is make sure that you're pretty close to the subject and there's as much room as possible in the background. Okay. A real life example. Imagine you're sitting in a room. Okay. Don't sit in a corner of a room. Don't sit with the wall directly behind you. Take your desk, you know, take a desk or something and put it in a location where you have a lot of room behind you. It's going to help create more depth of field. Now, if you have the ability to control a camera or a video by maybe changing the lenses, for example, or changing the aperture iris size, the larger, you can see the little number here, F3.5, F5.6, F10, F22. Um, these numbers represent the aperture size. So F3.5, that would be a larger aperture size in the camera uh, or video camera. And F22 would be a very small hole. Okay, so the smaller the hole, the bigger the depth, the larger the hole uh, in the iris or the aperture, um, the less the depth. And there are, of course, limits on what you can do because this affects how much light that comes through. But just understand that you can get a blurrier background if you use a shallower depth. Now, the last thing is something called lens compression. Uh, this is the third item that will help get a blurred background. If you shoot with a lens that has say like 18 millimeters, that's considered more of a wide angle lens. It's very difficult to get shallow depth of field. If you shoot with something that has say 200 millimeters, the compression effect of that lens will help blur the background, okay? Uh, we'll, we won't go into the scientific details behind that work, but just know that if you have a, a, a higher zoom lens, it's much easier to blur the background regardless of what the aperture is, okay? All right. Hook and story. Man, I, I've, I can't tell you the books that I've read on this and the hours I spent studying this. I wish that we could talk about this for, for 
a, a longer period of time, but I just want to kind of insert the idea in your mind. And I want you to go and research this more. There's a lot of information. You can go find something on the internet, but I want you, if you've never heard this before, if this is something new to you, I just want to give you the idea. Okay. And that is, uh, if you don't know what a hook is, a hook is something that you can say or show or do to kind of pull, that's where the hook comes from, pull the audience into the content. Now, where and when do you do it? Well, if you have a title to a piece of content, say like a YouTube title, you put, you make sure that there's a hook in that title in the thumbnail. When you create a YouTube thumbnail, you make sure you create your video at the very beginning of your video. You don't open up your title and say, Hey, uh, our sermon today is, you know, whatever you, you give a hook, you say something that is going to intrigue the mind of the person to keep listening. Okay. I'm going to say it again because th this is so important. When somebody watches your video, it's important that you do two things. All right. One, you want to reaffirm the, the, the idea or content that brought them there. Whatever you told them you were going to talk about or do, you reaffirm that idea. And number two, you say something that's a hook that attracts them into the story that you're about to tell, the content that you're about to present to keep them watching. Don't just say the title. I know people do it all the time, um, but it's just really poor use of the time that you have, especially when you consider the attention span of a person, right? We were talking about, you know, eight seconds, really. It, you better have a hook in that first eight seconds to attract the people into the content. Um, yeah, I, I want to talk about that more, but uh, let's, we don't forsake a time. I have to move on here. So um, we talked about some of the technical aspects, but really those things should be out of the way. You learn how to do them. You, you, you set up everything. So you have good audio. So you have good video and then you record the content. So, um, or maybe you stream it. So maybe you're streaming church service or maybe some live Bible study or whatever it is, uh, but you're going to record that content and then stream it. Each of those have their advantages. If you're doing live content, uh, it's easier to get people to watch live content in that moment. Um, but recorded content has, uh, has, you know, you have the advantages of being able to edit recorded content, fix things, add things to make it more interesting. Uh, I try to make most of my content recorded because it's just easier to create higher value content when you record it. So if you can record it, um, do that instead of streaming. Um, only stream when, when you have to make it that way. So let's say you, so you have an idea, um, you know, you have all your equipment set up, you have your story, the, the, the information you want to present, you make sure that you have a hook created to attract the people into the content, you record your content. And then obviously the next thing is, um, if you record it is to edit. Now, uh, Adobe Premiere and Apple Final Cut are really the only recommendations that I have. If you happen to be um, thinking about what can you use to record content or to, I'm sorry, to uh, edit content is learn how to use Adobe Premiere or uh, Apple Final Cut. Those two things are going to give you all the different tools that you'll need to do pretty much anything you want. I'm not saying you have to use them or you can only use those things. There are other things that, um, you know, that will allow you to edit, but Ideally, they give you the tools that you're going to need to perform the functions that I'm talking about, fixing audio and video, those types of things. Um, if you have specific questions, we'll cover those. But um, Adobe and, and um, our, I'm sorry, Premiere and Final Cut will allow you to add graphics and to trim. And that's really what you want to do. So if you've created something, let me give you like a real life example here, since we're talking pretty specific about content. Let's say you um, have church service, for example. My typical technique is I will live stream church service, right? Because in that moment, people want to watch church service live, right? It's a lot more difficult to get people to watch lot, like a recorded church service on Sunday or Monday or Tuesday or whatever. But it's, a, it's pretty easy to get people to watch live church service on Saturday, you know, on the Sabbath when it's actually happening. So my, my general technique is to live stream church service, and then I take that video and I will edit it, right? A lot of time we'll record it and then maybe we'll uh, re-upload it or something. But um, I will trim off the parts that are church and I'll just keep the sermon. 
when you put something on YouTube, you have to pray, stay pretty narrow as to the content because it's so difficult to reach people. So I take church service, which is a live stream, and then I turn it into just a sermon. Okay. And I use uh, an editing software or sometimes if you're just going to trim, you can do that directly on YouTube, but you want to trim out absolutely everything other than the sermon. Okay. So if you want to keep the prayer at the beginning, maybe you can do that. But generally, I don't even keep that. I, as soon as his content starts, in other words, sometimes the speaker will get up there and they might talk about something and then they get into their sermon. I trim everything out. Remember, we go back to keeping the attention of the person and the, and the attention span. If you told them that they're going to watch a sermon and then they click on the video and then for the first two minutes, it's not even the sermon, you're going to lose people. So trim out everything in the front end and just keep the sermon content from everything after the end, if you're singing or something like that, cut it out. Um, and I even suggest that your pastor pray and then you, then you sing. All right. If we're talking about church service, so do the sermon, tell them to pray. And then if you want to sing, do that after the fact, that way you can trim it out. That's good for two reasons. One, because you'll see a sharp drop off during that time. And it, you want to make sure that you create, um, you do something called, um, or I'm sorry, you build something called audience retention on YouTube, which you want to have high retention rates, which is keeping people and you want them to stay around for a long time. When you have say music at the end and everybody's like, Oh, the sermon's over and they just leave. You're hurting the ability of your video to reach more people unnecessarily. So cut it out, cut the beginning, cut the end out, just leave the sermon content. Um, and the other reason you want to do that is because music uh, I guess, you know, some of the, some of the sermon or I'm not, uh, some of the music we have in church is not copyrighted, but, uh, a lot of it, you're going to get a copyright, um, claim on YouTube because it recognizes the music and that's going to, that's going to hurt your video too, for a couple of different reasons. Um, so it's another good reason to, to cut that out. Uh, and then you can add graphics, you know, if somebody has Bible text, and they didn't already have graphics in their presentation, you can create graphics and put them in there to make it more interesting. If you need to fix the audio, raise the levels or maybe fix some problem or something like that, you can do that um, as well in an editing software. Maybe there's some mistake that you need to cut out. So that's the next step in the process. Now, after that, if you are recording or, or, or if you did record and then you edited something, you wanna upload the video obviously. And I'm just gonna go right back to what we've been saying here, what I've been saying. Um, which is YouTube is the place. All right. Put your videos on YouTube, use Facebook to promote those videos and get them over on YouTube. Now, when you upload, you don't want to just, you know, throw it on there. Whenever you finish, you want to do it at a very specific time. Now think about it. Now, every content is different, but since we're talking about church service here and um, I'm assuming everybody is, um, you know, seventh day Adventist, most people are going to be interested in that content at what time? right? It's going to be on the Sabbath. So we're talking about um, Friday evening and the Sabbath. That's really your, your biggest time um, to upload the content. And that's when most people are going to want to watch it. YouTube primarily uh, um, looks primarily at the first 24 hours of a video. So you want to put it on there whenever your audience is going to watch it. If you have a different audience and it's a different time, put it at that time. But whenever you think is going to be the most popular time for that video, you upload it maybe just before that, a few hours before uh, and it's going to give the video the most ability to be successful. Uh, and again, uh, as far as location is concerned, if you want to do it on IGTV, uh, IGTV or Facebook or what other, you know, Vimeo, you know, be my guest, but at least do it on YouTube. Don't neglect the most important location. All right. The next thing you want to do is to promote the video. I just mentioned that the first 24 hours is, is an important time on YouTube. And uh, their algorithm is looking to see how this video is doing, maybe compared to your last videos, compared to other videos. And you want to do whatever you can to promote that video during that time, um, that, that first initial time, so that it, it will reach the most amount of people possible. Now, how do you do that? Well, you can use your social media, right? That's a good thing to uh, use Facebook for, maybe Instagram. Um, if you have an email list, right? So uh, you should always be building an email list uh, of, of your audience members in some way. Give them free stuff, right? Create some kind of a free handout or something and just say, sign up for our list uh, and you'll get a free handout. You know, you can do all kinds of things, but have an email list and you want to email those people when you create content. Uh, YouTube has something called post. Um, it's kind of like Facebook has posts and you can do those posts in 
uh, YouTube as well. YouTube also has something called stories, which you can only do on a mobile device, but use those things to promote your video content right when you release it. Okay. So release that content uh, and then promote it on Facebook, on Instagram, through your email list, on YouTube posts and stories. And you're going to give the video content that you create the most ability to reach more people. And then last is you want to never stop learning. All right, I've talked about a lot of different things and really we've just kind of cut the surface here.